everybody and welcome back to our online platform. You are so welcome here. We are in a face-to-face -face sermon series discussing topics of the world that has heavy, heavy content and heavy discussions around them. Today I have the immense privilege of introducing our citywide visionary leader, Philip Pretorius, who would bring the message today. Enjoy. Yeah, okay, so uh, uh, that sounds like a few great ideas that you guys have. Sorry. Susan is calling. Yeah, so well, maybe some of the stuff that happened this weekend with the family. Yeah, it was really good. Thanks. We had a good Thanks. time together. This couple got married, actually, mm. and that was nice. Mm. Um, and sure, and, uh, that's really yeah, interesting. Yeah, we a bit. So, yeah, no, she did this weekend. I was kind of basically just trying to rest a little bit, but also still getting to a few like we had LGBT, like, okay. we had like, different things and like that we yeah. like we, that we wanted to get like, yeah. um, but it was a bit confusing at times and it just felt quite overwhelming at some yeah. some of the stuff. Um, but then we also watched some of the rugby, uh, like the savings and things that was happening. Yeah, also got to see some of the Olympics. That was pretty. Do you want to comment? You have a new notification. Yeah, no, I hear definitely. I mean, it was so cool to just to see some of the people actually swim and actually do some yeah. stuff, right? Yeah. Um, like. I'm excited for this evening. Like, uh, yeah. like, like, like. Uh, when it's actually like four like. minutes, right? Because um, it, it did feel a bit um, like I was missing. So, yeah. Like this picture. Hey, are you even listening to what I'm saying? I don't know. Whoa, whoa. Like, it's it's okay. It's okay. Like, I have this under control. Like, this is not a problem in my life. Like, I've got it sorted. Like, look, I can put it away. I'll show you. I'll show you. It has no hold over me. I can put it away. And then it's not going to bother anyone else. See? Okay. Hey. Hey, phone. I got us some new data. Good day, everybody. Thank you for listening to us online. And uh, we as a Tawny Church are busy with a series called Unmask Yourselves, Unmask Ourselves, where we un, you know, expose the uncovered life. And uh, for those of you listening to us online, we pray that this will be really a moment where you in your own time, on your own time there, sitting alone, can have a meeting with Jesus. And we pray that this will be, an, be beneficial to you. And as we share this with you, may the Holy Spirit be the person who actually communicates and preach to you directly. We appreciate you taking the time to spend time with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this incredible moment. Pray that every person who listens to this message, Father, will hear the heart beat of Jesus. I thank you that the love of God will touch them. And as we speak, Lord God, may this help them, may this encourage them, and may this help us, Lord God, all of us, so that we can love and obey you. In Jesus' name, amen. We've been speaking and we've been ministering a, a, a series called Unmask Ourselves. And over the last few weeks, we've dealt with topics like loneliness, anxiety. I think busyness is still to come for some of us. But also this past, you know, in this this week, we've been dealing with addictions. And um, so many of us may immediately dismiss oh, addictions. Oh, I'm not addicted, but I want us to open up our hearts to allow God to show us what are those go-to things in moments when we feel anxious and in moments we feel like out of control or life is pressing us hard. What are those go-to moments apart, apart from God? And uh, yeah, may God open up our hearts as we share about this. Our goal is also to help not just you, because first of all God always starts with us but how we can equip you that you can minister to a society around us that many people are struggling today and our God is to really help you how can you minister to those people so I want to start off with a illustration when we talk about addictions and I don't know if you've seen the movie Gladiator um, Gladiator is this incredible movie where these mighty warriors are actually sold as slaves and they were 
transported in these cages, you know, literally cages that they were taking them to this arena where the gladiator arena where they were Colosseum where they're going to actually have to fight for their lives. So once they get out of the cage, they put him actually in these big cages underneath the arena. And then ultimately they are led into the arena. We have these crowds of people around, you know, looking and actually so inhuman, celebrating the torture and the inhuman way of, you know, torturing and killing and destroying people's lives, you know, um, and uh, it's, it's like savaging, you know, people's lives. And you have these people in the middle of the arena fighting for their lives and they have these swords and they're standing, you know, back to back trying to cover and protect their own lives. And the next moment you have underneath the ground, these cages opening up and lions and, you know, tigers will come out of these cages and almost like gunning for them, going for them. And it almost feel like real life that the moment you look this way, something is coming from behind. And if you don't look on your right hand side, something's coming from the right or the left. And, you know, and then the crowds are there and they're actually shouting and waiting for your destruction. Um, and it sometimes feel like life could be like that. Now, I want to encourage you, you know, when we talk about this topic, the reality is many times we embrace a caged lifestyle and we kind of feel like it is normal for me to live within this cage and to be limited by these things and actually kind of controlled by things in our lives. And the message I'm bringing you this morning is that you can get out of the cage, that God really doesn't want us to live in this arena of things that are gunning for our lives, that, are ch- that wants to take control of our lives, but God wants to set us free that we can actually love and obey Him and serve His purposes. And may that be your testimony. I'm going to read for us from 1 Corinthians 6 verse 12 to 14. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all, but not uh, should not be dominated by any. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. God bless his word. Friends, we're looking at a passage that I believe so many times has been read and misunderstood. And so many people read it and almost like, you know, you read like a legitimacy into it, making decisions and all things are lawful and you can do all things. But is this really the context of this passage? I want to take us really back into what was really meant here and what Paul was addressing. Paul, keep in mind, it's the city of Corinth. Corinth is a city that's really lawless and major sexual immorality and people are kind of living independent and, and very self-righteous and so on. It seems like a lot of it is relevant to us today. And Paul was not kind of, a, 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 you know, almost like agreeing with them that all things are lawful, but Paul is actually addressing certain slogans that they were using to justify ungodly living. And so here's what Paul says, you say it's lawful, but is it helpful? You say it's lawful, But is this thing dominating you? So Paul was not agreeing with them. Paul was using relevant slogans, which they used in their society to justify ungodly living. What are some of the slogans you and I use today? What are some of the slogans our friends and society use today to justify, oh, that's just a man. Oh, that's just a woman. Oh, you know, oh, that's just human. That's just normal. I'm just a human being. God knows my heart. All these slogans we use, Is it really bringing us life or does that slogan justify the bondage and the cage living we live in? Does this justify it? And that's what Paul is addressing. So let's look at the first one. He says, all things are lawful for me. What Paul is saying is, yes, we do have the right to make decisions. Yes, we have the power to make our own decisions, but our freedom of choice does not mean that we have freedom of consequences. You may have freedom of choice and you may make decisions, but the consequence of our decisions are predetermined. You know, when you and I make a decision, we're going to turn right. Where that road leads you is already predetermined. Or if you choose, you're going to go left. Where that road leads you is predetermined. Paul says we have freedom of choice, but we don't have freedom of outcome. Is our choices, our choices leading us to spiritual fruitfulness, spiritual freedom? Is it beneficial to us or not? Then he goes on and says, food is meant for the stomach and stomach for the food. 
is Paul really concerned about food and what they're eating? See, now, if we take the whole context of the whole passage, Paul was addressing the whole Corinthian kind of culture where sexual immorality was at the order of the day. And Paul was saying, you know, the slogan they were using, it's normal for me to get hungry. It's normal for me to eat. I've got a stomach and I have to eat. If there's food available, I'm going to eat. What is Paul addressing? He's addressing a slogan that as normal as food is for my tummy, as more normal as food is for my stomach, so normal is it me just to have sex. I can do it whenever, whenever I'm hungry, I'm going to eat. And Paul is addressing and it says, you know what, you say that it's just normal. And it's important that we understand that our natural desires cannot dominate and control our lives and our behavior because even if it's natural it doesn't mean it's beneficial even if it's natural it should not control us it should not put us in a cage and other people in the cage because of the decisions we make our decisions cannot infringe on somebody else's freedom and many times our decisions when it puts other people in in bondage it hurts other people then is it really a good choice that we've made He says our natural desires and craving should not control or dominate us. And if we are, you know, controlled, defined by those natural desires, then those natural desires are not so natural. You see, as human beings, we were never created to sin. We were never, we were never created to be controlled by anything else, but to be in service of God. So to be honest, being human is actually not to sin. It's abnormal for us to sin. That's why our bodies and everything else reacts towards sin in a destructive manner because our bodies were created to worship God and not to sin. So our natural desires should not be a justification that we actually say, be therefore it's right to do it. It is not. Our bodies were created for the Lord and the Lord was created for us. And that means our desires should align with our original design. And our original design is to design to worship God. And it's for the Lord. He goes on and says, God will destroy both. What is he saying? Will God destroy the tummy, the stomach? Will God destroy the, um, you know, food? What he's saying is, it's not about just the food we eat now and the, our stomach at the moment. He says, whatever Decisions we make, be careful to make temporary decisions that will have eternal consequences. In the view of eternity, both food and the stomach will no, will be irrelevant. It will be destroyed. But the decisions we make today, the decisions that you make, the decisions that I make can and will have a eternal effect. Don't make in the 50, 60, 60 years we on earth, don't make temporary decisions that has an eternal effect on your life. That's what Paul is addressing here. He says, our natural desires do not and should not determine our moral obligations. We are members of God in chapter verse 15. Our bodies are members of God and we should act in that way that our bodies are members of God. What are some of the slogans that you are mindful of at the moment? What are some of those things we say, oh, it's lawful, oh, it's okay. We just dismiss it. And friends, some of those things are are small things, but some of the things that we dismiss actually have a major effect on our obedience towards Christ. Does our obedience and does our lifestyle and our decisions takes us more towards a place of actively serving God or do we become more passive towards God? See, because we work on a sliding scale. On this side is passivity. On this side is really participatory. And when you and I make decisions, we are either going to become more participating in God's kingdom, serving Jesus, and then be more passive to the world, or we're going to become more participating in the world and much more passive towards God. You are always active in one direction. It's either towards God, it's towards the world. And that's what our decisions ultimately has an effect and the result of our decisions. He goes on and says, the body is meant, is not meant for sexual immorality. See here, Paul brings the whole food for the stomach and, you know, together into what he's actually saying. Our bodies are not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. The body was not meant for sexual immorality or any other form of destructive and dysfunctional behavior. It's not just sexual immorality. Paul is saying anything that has a dysfunctional, destructive, addictive, behavioral effect on us 
It's not good for us. It's not good for our bodies. Our bodies were not created to be dependent on those things. Our bodies were created to be dependent on God and the life-giving power of Jesus to flow through our lives and these other things that are actually destroying us. Jesus has the answer to set us free. Friends, I want you to know today that freedom is possible. Every single human being on the face of the earth can be free. But we only get free as we embrace the truth. When we realize, man, I'm in this arena. I'm in this, this cage and I want to get out. If you want to get out, you can get out. The gospel is the answer. Jesus unlocks those cages and helps us to get out so we can live a free life. And we're going to look at what it means to be, have a free life. And then it goes on and says, but not all things are helpful. So Paul is saying, you say it's lawful, but is it helpful? You say it's lawful, but is this thing dominating your life? Is this controlling? Is this mastering your life? Means when you call it, you take a cell phone and the moment it rings, you answer. The moment it rings, you answer. You know, it's almost like when this thing calls you, when this thing that you're really dependent on, your go-to, that go-to thing when you're under pressure, when you feel anxiety, when you feel like, you know, the world's things are crashing down on you, pressing down on you. What is that go-to apart from God? When that thing calls you, I answer. I put it on. I look at it. I'm grabbing all of it. I'm going to a thing. It might be even secret, but see, the power of sin is in its secrecy. And the moment we keep it, as long as we keep it in darkness, that thing will master us. It will have hold over us. And as I'm mentioning to you today, I pray that you will have a desire. So Lord, I want to bring this into the light. I cannot no longer allow this thing in darkness to keep me in this cage. I don't want to be in this arena anymore where I'm to watch my back and my sides all the time because I, I, I miss the gospel. I miss the message of Jesus Christ that really can set me, set me free. He thinks, he says, all things are in my power, but I cannot be brought under the power of any but Christ. Are we free to do the will of God? And John 8 verse 34 to 36, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. But this, a slave has no permanent place in a family, but a son belongs to it forever. Just want to pause there. He says, anyone who sins is a slave to sin, which means there's a habitual kind of characteristic of it. It's something you keep on doing. You're coming back to, coming back to. And later on, this thing actually starts to take control over you. So what is the effect of this habitual sin in our lives? It actually calls us away from sonship, which means that we become not permanent. He says a, a slave does not have permanency in the family because a slave is going to move on, but the son stays forever. There's something about sin that makes you and I, our commitments waver. We cannot be committed. We cannot be permanent. We make commitments, but we can't follow through with it. We step into relationships, but we can't work, th we can't work through it and really stay to it. We get committed to church, but then we can't commit to it. You see, what sin does, sin wants to make us passive towards God and active towards the world. And that makes us inconsistent. But God says, a son stays permanent. Now, how do we become sons? Well, the Bible says, the son sets us free from sin so we can become sons. There's freedom in Christ that's possible to all of us as we allow and we say, God, we realize there's a thing in our lives. There's this thing that chases me the whole time. I want to bring it to the light. I want to bring this and say, Lord, help me to overcome this so that this power of this addiction, this thing in my life can be broken. You see, sin makes our relation with God inconsistent. It makes our relationship with the body of Christ and the church inconsistent. It makes our relationship with our family inconsistent. It's ultimately having a relational effect on our lives that's self-destructive. Sin will always lead, lead us to isolation. The moment Adam sinned, he isolated. The moment you see signs of isolation, you must know that sin is knocking on your door. It's pulling you away from relationship. It's pulling you away from community. It's putting you in isolation. Why? Because the moment you can put yourself in isolation and the pressure and anxiety takes over, addiction is the future. That's what happens with us. The only solution to self-saving powers and trying to depend on ourselves is to turn to Jesus, the Son, and the gospel. That's the only solution. Galatians 5, verse 13 to 14 says, For you were called to freedom. God calls us to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But how do you use your freedom? 
She is the key. When do you see people really free? When they free from themselves, they start to serve God and they start to serve others. He says, but through your love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the Bible says the two greatest commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Those two commandments, love God, love your neighbor, are signs that you and I become free. See, somebody who's sinful, what is sin? Sin is self-fulfilling, self-protecting, self-gratifying. It's self-focused, it's self-centered. What does God do? God takes us and deny yourself. Put yourself aside, put yourself down and put yourself at the cross. Focus on Jesus, focus on others. And the moment I become focused on others and not on self and I become free from self, I don't need to take and get things to fulfill self. I don't have to fill these gaps with some other things. I can actually turn to Jesus and I'm going to become a giver and not a taker. And that's where the freedom comes from. So let's look specifically, I've just shared the foundation, a theological foundation with us. Now I'm going to focus on two more areas. I'm going to focus on what is addiction and then how do we get out of addiction? What is addiction? I'm not an expert. I've never studied this. But in our studies now, doing my master's, we dived into this as a pastoral issue because this is really, this is real in the, in the time and day we live in. And so... I'm going to share with you just some discoveries I've made about addiction. First of all, addiction can be defined as Gerald May says, a repeated destructive behavior that a person feels compelled to continue regardless of the consequences. Here's the amazing thing. People don't stop with addictions because there are bad consequences. In fact, you and I know when we sin, we know there are consequences. See, the consequences is not what we should regret and because of the consequences we stop sinning. Why do we sin? Why do we grab hold of this thing that we know has bad consequences, but we still take the risk to do it? Because here's the actual truth about sin. I don't know about you, but myself. You know why we sin? You know why I sin? It's because we like it. We really enjoy it. We find benefit from this thing, even if it's temporary. I find benefit in it. So the only way we start to not want it is not because of the consequences. We need to say, Lord, forgive me for the benefit I get from the sin apart from you. I rather want to turn to you that you to satisfy me and not the sin. See, God is taking that moment in our lives and he exposes something in our hearts that we turn to something else but God and rather turn to God. Another understanding of addiction is this addiction is a desire disorder to repress the worship of God. You and I were created to worship God, of God to repress the worship of God, express itself as an addiction. We long to love God and our neighbor. That's the way God's made us. We long to love God and our neighbor, but addiction uses up our desires on self. Addiction is a Total self-centered, self-fulfilling, self-protecting, you know, desire. It's a desire disorder. Addiction is slavery to faithless, loveless desires. It is a voluntary slavery. These are decisions we make that actually puts us in this place of being mastered by something else. We can be addicted to more than just substance. So many times we think about addictions. Oh, I'm not on heroin or this or that substance. You know, I'm not alcoholic. Um, but it's more than that. It's not just substance. It's also behavior. Here's examples of addictions. The internet. I mean, Facebook, social media. Those things can be addicted where you say, I don't have time. And then you look in a year's, you know, one week, how much time have I really spent on social media, scrolling through things like mindless scrolling through things. And ultimately, you don't feel better. You just actually feel kind of zonked by all the kind of things that you went through on social media. Food can be addiction. Sex can be addiction. Love, work, gambling, shopping. Porn, identities. We live in a, in a world that has got so much gender confusion and all these kind of things. And we want to justify it. And we identify with this and identify with that. And a lot of these identities actually become idolatry where we kind of make our identity the main thing we need. And it's almost overemphasis on personal identity rather than actually finding our identity in God and we relate with God. Stress, phobies. I mean, gaming, moods, beliefs, exercise. There are so many different, you know, examples of behavioral 
and substance, things that can become addictions in our lives. Addictions ultimately is a control issue. I find myself out of control and I have to take control. And I have to do something. And sometimes it's these temporary decisions we make over and over that ultimately becomes habit. Addiction is an anxiety disorder. It is to manage our anxiety without faith and love for God and people. We're trying to do it in a self-centered way. What is the cause of addiction? Well, the world gives us many ideas and definitions, weak world, or it's because of unprocessed pain or medical, you know, diseases, some kind of syndrome, it's genetic. You know what? That's what the world says. But what is the Bible saying about it? See, the Bible always will give me new solutions. The Bible has a desire to get you out of the cage. The, the Bible has a desire, the gospel main purpose is to set those in bondage free. Where does freedom start? See, the world wants to make sure that you and I excuse our behavior, our decisions from ourselves, and it's because of my dad, it's because of my mother, it's because of society, it's because of something else. It's a syndrome, it's a disorder, it's something else, so I cannot take personal responsibility, and if I can't take personal responsibility, how can I personally be set free? See, the essence of all we battle with needs to come to a place which nobody else is mistake. It's nobody else to be blamed. I have to come to a place where I take personal responsibility. You see, the more moment I avoid personal responsibility, freedom is impossible. Freedom exists when you and I can humble ourselves and own up, own our part. We're not taking you know, responsible for the whole world. But what is my part in this decision? What is my part in this dysfunction? And that part I can take to Jesus. And because I humble myself, I can find forgiveness and I can find freedom in it. The three categories, the Bible defines a lot of the addictions. The first one is false worship. We turn from God who defines us, who leads us to an idol. We find our solution in idolatry. We find our, our, our idol is something that defines us, that we, do, that we draw strength from, that gives us identity, and it gives us purpose and a sense of significance and acceptance. If we find that apart from God, that is something that pulls us away where I now become addicted to the social media or this thing that I need. It's almost like this fix I need apart from Jesus. Lustful desires. Now, lust is not just about sexual sins. Lust is actually defined the opposite of love. What is love? The, the absolute example of love is Jesus. He came to the earth. He sacrificed himself. He hanged on a cross. He gave himself completely so that others will benefit. So what is love? Love is you seek the benefit of others at your own expense. What is lust? Lust is you seek your own benefit at others' expense. So here's the question. Am I using people to benefit self or am I spending self to benefit others? That's the difference. So what is addiction? I'm using everything else around me to benefit self. What is, and that's lustful. But when we're loving, it's a Lord. Lord, how can I be filled by you and the filling of God give, makes me a giver so I can go into the world and spend myself so that others benefit because I gained from Christ's expense. I benefited. See, friends, what is the effect of addiction? Well, the effect of addiction primarily has three main effects. It's psychologically, it is physiologically, and it's also spiritually. Physiological means it has a chemical addictive effect on our bodies. When we, you know, our brain seeks to retain chemical balance. And so when we get into these moments of addictions, it spikes a dopamine in our brain and it creates abnormal, normal neurological pathways in our brain again. And then what happens over time, those things become set. And that's why you find the habits become so strong that you actually need external help to be set free. See, it is an endless cycle of reducing the brain's ability to make healthy choices. Wow. Addiction takes us into an endless cycle that reduces the brain's ability to make healthy, healthy choices. It's a behavior to produce the patterns. Our behavior now start to produce patterns and these become habits and these things ultimately become neurological pathways. And we need to trust God to set us free from those things. The second thing is it's psychologically. That means it's emotional. 
Our mind, our emotions are actually fueled by this. And then fear and resentment and other things kick in. And those things start to have a, a major effect on our, you know, mind and our emotions. And we can be set free from that also. And the last thing that we see from addictions, it is spiritual. We're coming under the power only of two. It's either God or it's demons. It's either God or it's the enemy. There's no other power that is mastering us. And see, for us, God wants to be the one who leads us because he leads us into life and everlasting life and freedom where Satan has one idea with your life and my life. It's to destroy us. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. God came so that you and I can have life and life in abundance. So I want to encourage us. 2 Peter 2 verse 19 says, they promised them freedom. The world promises freedom while they themselves are slaves of depravity. Friends, be careful of voices, friendships, circles, social media, the world that promise you. What's happening in the world now? Oh, freedom is hidden behind identity. Freedom is hidden behind that. And every promise of freedom, we've just seen with the Olympics and the opening, and we can see with the, the, the condition of the world where the world is at. And the world is promising a freedom apart from God. And the more the world embarks on that kind of freedom, the more the world goes into a destructive behavior. Because apart from God, there is no freedom. It's only in God that you and I find freedom. He says, for a man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. Friends, the only true freedom is when Christ masters my life. True freedom is never to be free to make your own choices, to actually, just be, because we're a slave of ourselves. True freedom is to be a complete, surrendered, willing slave of Jesus Christ and desire to build his kingdom and avail our bodies, our soul, our time, our talents, and our treasures to God to build his kingdom. That is what true freedom is. We do not overcome addiction. How do we overcome the addictions? 1 Corinthians 6 verse 14 that last verse gave us the key. And God raised the Lord. It's Jesus. Jesus lived the life you and I should have lived. He died the death. We should have died. I should have died. In our place, he lived that life. In our place, he paid the full penalty because he so loved us. And he was literally, he sank into the grave, died. And God the Father raised him from the grave. He overcame death. What is the message to us? That if Jesus can overcome human death, can he not overcome while we are alive our human failures, our human sinfulness, our human addiction? Here's the good news that it's not something that needs to be done. Jesus was raised from the dead. That gives us faith, that gives us hope, that gives us something in our heart, that because Jesus conquered death, he can conquer any addiction. He can conquer any pain. He can conquer anything you overcome. The only thing we need, put your faith in Jesus and not in something else. God raised Lord the Lord. And will he also raise us up by his power? And will also, and will also raise us up. By his power. You see, he conquered the death. And by that same power, he will raise you up. He will raise me up. If we put our faith in him, the victory is possible in Christ Jesus. So how do we see this victory become reality? Friends, the cause of many of our addictions and things in our lives, healing in our lives that's needed, is ultimately the answer is relational. See, we think we need to isolate somebody. Loneliness and anxiety is the stimulant for addictions. When we get lonely, God takes the lonely, puts him in family. See, God wants to bring us into relationship because that's the answer. We need connectivity, not disconnectivity. We need to be connected. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 7 to 8, give us the answer. How do we overcome? Night is the time when people sleep and drinkers get drunk. But let us who live in the light be clear-headed, protected by the armor of what? Of faith and love and wearing our helmet, the confidence of our salvation, faith, love, and our salvation. So the three basic things, how we can overcome addiction and how we overcome sin. The first one is faith. 
our faith that he who was raised from the dead can even make my mortal sinful dead body. He can raise me up. He can change it. He can change my habits. He can change my desires. He can change anything. That's the gospel we preach. That's the gospel we believe. And that's the gospel not just to be preached. That's the gospel throughout history proven to be true. The word of God is true. You see, and we believe it. You see, in one moment when you put your faith in God, where you get saved, but through your salvation, after you're a Christian and you battle with stuff, you go to the same Jesus and you put your same trust in that Jesus and that Jesus who saved us continues to save us. He can continue to, to set us free. We're not turning to works. We keep our faith in Jesus. You see, because through that faith in Jesus, no temptation has seized us. But with that temptation, there's an outcome. That's what 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 tells us. The outcome is Jesus. Put your trust in God. How do you do that? Take small steps of faith risks. Step out in faith. Trust God. And let that risk upon risk as you step out in faith. See Jesus coming through for you. Build up your hope. The second way we overcome is love. Be restored back into relationship and into healthy community. Friends, we all are... Absolute, we were created to be loved. We were created to love. The absence of love is the presence of addiction. You see, we need healthy love in our lives. And God brings us not just, in, he don't, He's not only, only saving us so that we can have a relationship with God, which is the first and prime relationship. He saves us so we can have a relationship with other people. He brings us back into community. He takes the lonely, puts them in a family. He takes the orphan. He adopts them into family. God puts us back into relationship. Love is what we need. When godly love fills our love tanks, it fills up the spaces that sometimes needs to be filled by other stuff. And we are all relational beings. And the essence of sin is breaking relationship. So what is the essence of Christianity? It's restoring and building relationship. And that's what God calls us in to his relationship. And the third last point, how we overcome, is hope. We are being restored back when somebody has got even sin. Friends, the thing that helps me and you is the fear of God. But with that comes understanding, seek ye first the kingdom of God, the understanding of purpose. And you and I are alive on earth today for a purpose. When you wake up in the morning and you have no purpose and there's nothing why you're you know, awake and why you study, we live in a society that has no purpose. You see, God gives us purpose. He gives us hope again that you and I are a calculated design. We're not an element of evolution that just popped. We are People that are created by a creator for a purpose. And when you find a God-given purpose, even as a businessman, a businesswoman, a student, I mean, it doesn't matter where you come from, that purpose gives you a reason in your soul why you live. And now you can take those small steps of, of victory, small steps of, of, of hopeful purpose in your life. You're sitting there and you ask yourself, what are the areas where you feel hopeless? Ask God to give you hope again and give you a future. So let me conclude. Faith, the gospel that saves us, is the same gospel that keeps on sanctifying us. God puts us with love into relationships. Love, where you and I can love one another, we can receive love, and we can give love. And because of that community and healthy love we get, something in our love tank is filled up that takes up the space where addictions always want to root itself. And the last one is God gives us a purposeful hope in our hearts that He's created us for something specific. Friends, as you sit there and you ask yourself, but where does it leave you? Why don't you ask God for one thing? What is that go-to when you feel stressed out? What is that thing that we run to? I just need to relax. What is that thing? And I'm by that not saying it's wrong. If you feel stressed out, go and jog. It's healthy. If you feel stressed out, go and sleep, go and relax. Ask yourself, what is the thing that actually has a habitual thing that you do that ultimately has a destructive, relational, and behavioral destructive effect on your life? That's the thing that God wants to send us free from. It's not everything. It's those things that you know that you know. This thing has a negative effect on my life. So where do you start? Recognize it. Take ownership. Recognize that. Repent of it. Ask God's forgiveness. Bring it to the cross. Then ask God, Lord, restore, restore, you know, this area of my life, the healing that I need, and then reconnect 
with God and with other people so you can walk in healthy relationships to journey with you through this thing till you've conquered in this area. I want to pray with you today. What is that one thing that God is showing you? Could be more than one, but at least that one thing that you know that the Spirit convicts you right now of that you feel like, man, I'm in a cage here. I'm not free. How do you know you're free? How active are you pursuing God? How active are you on mission? Want to serve God and want to love and obey God? How active are you and enjoying serving other people? That's the measure of freedom. And may God help us that we really walk out of the arena where everything is chasing us and people are shouting us, getting out of the cage. And we literally step out of the arena into a world where we can start to minister to other people. Freedom is possible to you also. Father, I thank you for every single person listening to this message. Oh Lord, I pray that Holy Spirit, you know where they are sitting in their rooms, in their offices, sitting on some couch somewhere. Father, you know who they are. Father, you know exactly where they're at and you love us. You love us so much that 2,000 years ago, you already allowed your son to be crucified so that we can be set free. And Lord, I pray that every lie that says you cannot be free, Father, that those lies will be broken as I pray now for people. I pray, Father, that people start just to believe, put their trust in Jesus so freedom is possible. Lord, I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you convict and show specific areas that we need to repent. But as we repent, may we find grace where you empower us to overcome the very thing we battle with. Thank you for healthy community that you put around these people, that they can journey in open relationships, honest relationships, so that victory can be further, become a reality in their lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and may you prosper. And I pray that you would inspire God's, just God's presence, God's peace over your life. As we live in this society, you and I can be free. God bless. Thank you, Philip, for that amazing message. If you have any questions or concerns, please comment below. Ask us. We would love to connect with you. If you would like to find out of who we are as a church family and what we believe, also in the description, there is a link you can follow to our webpage. As always, hit that like, subscribe, and see you again next week.